All right, can folks hear me okay? Looks like the microphone's on. I've got a little webcam issue in that it's working fine on the Zoom with Nick, uh, but the OBS, it doesn't want to show the webcam right now. Let me try one more time. Yeah, it's just showing that still shot of me. But I think we can just work through that. And so, because we're going to bring Nick on pretty quickly here. So if folks can tell me if you can just at least see me, obviously you're not, or excuse me, hear me. You're obviously not seeing me live. You're just seeing some bad close-up of my forehead, which is not flattering. Um, okay, sounds like the audio is good. That's the main thing. And yeah, I think the the webcam view of me is not the important part right off the bat. You obviously can hear me. And then once I drag the Zoom viewer or get the Zoom going, uh, hopefully that will that will work well. So seems to be working okay. So we'll give it a couple more minutes here and we'll get started. Thanks everyone for joining this very special live stream broadcast. We have our moderators, Mandy Joe and Susan Helmer on the live chat. And they'll be doing the heavy lifting today as they always do about just keeping things moving, keeping it organized, aggregating the questions and just doing all the good stuff there. So, uh, yeah, we'll just say hi to a couple folks here before we get started. The format for today will be a very brief kind of welcome introduction, a little short, maybe like 60 second update from Amanda Joe on the latest in Iceland. And then we'll get right to Nick and we'll have Nick for the rest of the time. Uh, we'll go through some material I have prepared to kind of get our conversation flowing with him and let him speak to some things as we kind of work through a, a timeline and then we'll kind of have a big picture discussion and then later in the broadcast we'll get to question and answer session from the viewers and you can either ask those questions to Nick you can ask one to me or you can ask one to both and the moderators will make sure that that's laid out in terms of how they'd like to get those questions so they can aggregate those. So make sure you specify who you want your question to go to. Um, I know a lot of Nick's viewers are used to the all caps system of questions. Our moderators do it a little bit differently. They ask for, um, oh, let's see, what do they got here? Yeah, they want basically the big question mark kind of preceding it. Obviously, they're just looking for something that stands out uh, and catches their attention because the live chat can scroll kind of quickly and things can move uh, quickly there. Um, they also ask, I think one of their standing rules as well is that you limit the number of emojis you use there to two or three. Uh, so don't go overboard on lots of crazy emojis, but we're all happy to have you here. Uh, and we're hoping to have a very positive, uh, respectful and productive session together. That's the goal for today. Yeah, so precede your questions for Sean and Nick with a question mark or something similar. And then I would, I would imagine <clears throat> specifying which one of us you want that question to go to and be directed to or else uh, both if it's a question for both of us. We probably won't be able to get to all the questions that are posed, but we'll do the best we can to get to uh, many of those. I kind of have a a soft cap in my head of keeping this thing at around two hours max. So hopefully that will work well. I want to be considerate of our, our guests time. And also I have some commitments later in the day as well. So. Alrighty. So looks like we have a lot of people coming in. That's great. And we'll get officially started here in a couple of minutes. I'll need to figure out this webcam game later. Um, somehow having OBS Studio and Zoom on at the same time might be the problem, not sure. But I can see on Zoom, on my other screen here, uh, that it seems to be fine. I can see both Nick and I. Looks like Nick's doing some stretches. You guys can't see that. Now he's doing a little disco dance. Yeah, I, sh I should turn the camera on. I'm tempted. Uh, okay, I won't. <laughs> yeah, if you're like me, Nick, like sitting in the chair for hours, it's uh, y you got to move around or something. 
these some of these long ones you've done I feel like a half time and you're used to doing your walkabout now so he's he's just kind of getting some stretching in so but we'll we'll get him on here in a second all righty let me check one or more other thing here so we got the zoom is working uh, I see all the live chats coming through people from all over that's great news we are going to focus a lot of our the questions today on the topic that we're covering today so I know a lot of you might have questions about Iceland and I will try to get another either video or live stream update out possibly tomorrow or Tuesday sometime early this next week to discuss some of the things going on there so I know there's still a lot of interest and questions in that arena so bear with me on the silly little webcam view and I can take that out too if that's just distracting but I'll just leave it up just so you know I'm on the other end of this thing until we get Nick on and then we'll be good to go all right team uh, it is officially 10 a.m. here Mountain Standard Time, 5 p.m. in Iceland, UTC, 9 a.m. in the Pacific Northwest. <clears throat> and so we are going to get started. Thanks for joining me. I'm geology professor Sean Wilsey. This is a very special live stream broadcast of uh, a person that really deserves, doesn't really need any introduction from me, um, but we'll do it nonetheless, Nick Zentner from Central Washington University. So we'd like to welcome him. We'll have him on the video and the audio here in a few minutes. But want to welcome all of you for joining us. Thanks for choosing to spend your Sunday morning, afternoon, or maybe it's even Monday where you are with us here as we spend some time discussing geology and public outreach and communicating science and how all that works. Um, as a quick little update to what happened yesterday, some of you might have been on my live stream yesterday. It was a, a bit of an exciting time over in Iceland. I was at dinner, or not dinner, excuse me, breakfast with some friends and my wife, and I was getting lots of messages from Amanda Joe. We actually ended up uh, FaceTiming over uh, a Messenger and realized there was a lot of earthquake activity happening and it looked like there was possibly going to be an eruption yesterday and I was initially excited of course with all that news and as that data was coming in and as the day kind of wore on and we did do a live stream yesterday but it became apparent that the earthquakes weren't migrating upwards that the pattern we'd expect to see that's indicative of magma migration towards the surface uh, feeding an eruption just wasn't fully coming together and so that meant that we did have the earthquakes yesterday but that they more or less indicated that magma had pushed through and intruded uh, some new areas, some new fracture spaces in the rocks in the subsurface. Uh, but they did evacuate the town of Grindavik and that is still, that evacuation order is still in place today. According to Manja Joe, they're gonna reassess that around 7 p.m. To later today. Um, and this is all from Amanda Joe who put together a nice little brief update. Uh, there was about 130 earthquakes yesterday from about 4 to 5 p.m. in Iceland, their time. And then last night there was about 30 or so, and just a couple this morning. But basically not nearly the quantity um, that we had yesterday during that, that earthquake swarm. And so nothing right now is indicative of that event repeating or that an eruption is likely to take place. Uh, so. So we're not expecting anything in the next few hours in Iceland, but of course things can change and uh, develop quite quickly. There's new hazard assessment map from the Met Office. They've um, changed a few of their alert levels in some of the areas. Uh, and then they state that the probability of an eruption over the next few days is likely to increase. And the calculations from this, what they're calling a dike event, an intrusion event yesterday, shows that an ins insignificant amount of magma flowed from the magma body or the sill uh, under Svartsengi. So in kind of keeping with what I was talking about yesterday, just it was a small amount of magma that propagated through the rocks, probably widened out fric fractures, um, forced its way through rocks and, and initiated and generated some of those earthquakes. So, so that's what's going on in Iceland. We'll kind of pay attention to that as we go forward. Um, thanks again to Amanda Joe for putting that together. One last little comment here before we get going 
on, with Nick is on the live chat and in the comments today, if we can all just remember to be respectful and considerate. Um, let's all communicate with the intent of learning and listening to each other. Uh, no politics or agendas, please. And then after, again, after the discussion with Nick, we'll open things up for questions on the live stream and just follow our moderators and instructors there. So, and we'll get to as many as we can. So um, that's sort of the idea of where we're going today. Just one last quick announcement here is that I do have some more space on some of these field trips I have planned. So if you're interested in joining me on some of these field trips, I have a two-day field trip. You can pick either day or both in April. Uh, places around Twin Falls, the Snake River Canyon. We'll be looking at Bonneville flood evidence, Malad Gorge, some of the volcanic rocks, Box Canyon. There's other places in that region. There's still some space there. The Iceland one, of course, is filled. And then there's another window of time for field trips in June around the southern Idaho region. A day at Craters the Moon, a day at City of Rocks uh, in the Albion Mountains, and then a day north of Twin Falls at Black Magic Canyon, another place called Little City of Rocks, and some other really unique places as well. That Those dates are getting more full, but there's a couple spaces left. And so if you're interested in those, you can shoot me an email and, and I'll send you the details. Uh, if you can't make those, look for some others in the fall or later in the summer, perhaps. Haven't planned that far ahead just yet. So, okay, without further ado, we are going to bring in our special guests. So give me a second to move all the things around on my screen and work the magic here. Okay. Let's see. I'm new to this. I'm not an old pro like Nick is, so it takes a minute or two. I think we just can do this, right? Yeah, there we go. Does that work okay? Then we can take out my little webcam head. That looks pretty good. And then uh, we can add a little screen share here. Let's just start here. Um, Let's just start here, actually. So does that look okay? Is everyone, does it look okay to you, Nick, from your point of view? Looks great. You're doing great, Sean. Awesome. Can everyone hear Nick okay? Let's make sure real quick. I want to make sure, too, that the, the audio is balanced. I know with my interview with Professor Thorderson, I was a little, a little bit louder and he was a little softer. But what I'm hearing is Nick and I sounding pretty much balanced. So maybe just give us a quick indicator there on the live chat and let us know we're five by five but does it does it sound pretty balanced in terms of i just don't want to be the loud one and and nick sound like the soft one well i can talk a little bit and say i got my eye on that banana over there and that apple that looks pretty <laughs> good sean that must be from albertson's maybe in yeah. twin falls idaho yeah my i mean i, I think right now <laughs> we're seeing you know take away the two people's views here if you just look at the backgrounds that might be the most striking differences uh the the messy chaotic office and then you're you know you got your john stockton ball and just everything's it just got a nice touch there so i need to have you come help uh, rearrange mine or decorate or something so awesome well thanks again nick for joining us if if you're new to nick zentner he is a geology instructor uh, at Central Washington University. He also has multiple platforms where he talks about geology and educates the public. Um, he was gracious enough to let me on his program about a month ago. I got on Nick's YouTube channel and we did a live stream on the Bonneville flood. We were joined with uh, Jim O'Connor uh, and it worked out really well. And he agreed to reciprocate and come on to my program. And as I thought about it, I'm like, well, gosh, I'm going to have Nick Zentner. This might be the one time. He's a busy guy. You might not get him again. Who knows? And so what, what do you want to do with him? What do you want to talk to him about? And I really thought that I didn't necessarily want to talk to him about the Pacific Northwest geology or the Ice Age floods, even though I'm interested in those things. <clears throat> I really wanted to talk more about his efforts in 
educating the public with science and his what he's been doing the last 15 plus years. Um, I'll admit I, I'm a fanboy. I've I I tasted the Nick Zentner Kool Aid many years ago um, and kind of thought, man, that guy's got it figured out. And and what what could I do in my little neck of the woods that that would be as as impactful as what he's doing? Um, and so this episode's not going to have a lot of hardcore geology. We're not going to show you outcrop photographs and graphics and Google Earth per se, even at all. Um, but I think the topic we're discussing is one that's really important. And I think you as viewers have a lot to say about this. Your insights are just as important as what Nick and I might say, because we're coming at it from our perspective uh, as scientists and educators, but the public is the other critical piece of that. Um, so um, any thoughts there, Nick, so far before we get started? I'm kind of nervous right now. <laughs> oh, you, hey, let's just talk like we did a couple days ago, right, okay? Like there's nobody watching, it's just you and I, and it, it is uh, very special for me to be here, Sean, and you have done such amazing things over the last few years, it's been fun to see your growth. And yeah, you're way more popular than I am with all this <laughs> stuff. And you have figured out how to be unique. So it's a great thing. And I'm happy to just go back and forth. I got to be careful, though. I want to make sure you know, I'm going to be asking you just as many questions as you're asking me. I want this to be a back and forth. Okay, you got my you got my promise on that? Yeah, I can handle that. I, I know your okay. style. I know you well enough. So I, I, I'm i pretty okay. prepared. So um, good. No, I appreciate that. Thanks. And um, let's yeah. just let me just start with because I think it's important. I think a lot of the viewers know your story to some degree, but a lot of people might be new. They picked up on Nick Zentner during COVID uh, and there's a history that goes back so much further than that. So mm -hmm. let's see if I can pull up the the fun little slideshow and also keep our, our heads on the screen at the same time. Um, oh boy. Yeah, so does that, let's see. Ooh. There we go. Okay, so can everyone see, you can see Nick and I, and you can see uh, the slides there. Is that working? Yes. Okay, sweet. We can see that. Okay, great. So I want to go back to you come to Central Washington University early in your career. Maybe it was, I think it was in the 90s, something mm -hmm. like that. Maybe walk us through like kind of your approach. What your What was your job description? What were you asked to do as a new faculty member at Central Washington? Well, let's see. Uh, I'll make it brief. Uh, I begged my way into the geology department here. There was no job. And um, actually, you know what? Can we do Cochise? Can you stop your share for just a second, yeah, Sean? Yeah, for sure. Oh, Cochise. I forgot That's that. My, that. That was my safe word with Jerome to, to get him off the share thing for just a second. Yeah, yeah. Because I, because I, I am serious. So it, even to answer that question, right? maybe, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll talk about very early stages and then I want to hear your version as well. And okay. then we can go back to those slides if you want. Okay. Um, I mean, I'm a guest here. I want to do what you want to do. But at the same time, <laughs> I, I want to go back and forth. You have full um, full reign to hijack the show and, and take it okay. in a different direction <laughs> if you want to. So Not what I want to do. But I, yeah, I, so you're asking, you know, what, what were my, what were the expectations when I first came to Ellensburg, Washington, Central Washington University? Um, there was no job. I wrote letters to every university and every community college in the Pacific Northwest in the spring of 1992. My first teaching job was in Southern Ohio. I was newly married. We had our first child and we both had good jobs in Oxford, Ohio. I taught at Miami University and my wife taught at the local high school, but uh, we missed the mountains and we knew we wanted to, to get out back out West. She's from Pocatello. And so uh, we told our bosses we're leaving in the summer of 1992, and they thought we were playing hardball, but but we weren't. We just we wanted to leave. And so this is before the internet. So I'm writing letters to all these schools, and I only heard back from two schools, Central Washington University, saying, "Oh yeah," because I, I I recorded myself teaching in the classroom, I hired somebody to bring in one of those huge cameras <laughs> in the back of the room in 1992. And I, I made VHS tapes. And I sent a VHS tape of me teaching 
to each of these schools. Didn't hear from anybody except Central Washington University and College of Southern Idaho in Twin Falls, Idaho. What? Have you heard of, have oh you heard of that gosh. school? Oh my gosh, I did not know this part of the story. That is crazy. Well, first of all, that's bold to be like, hey, you, you don't have a position open. There's nothing listed, but you want me and I'm going to tell you and show you why you want me. That's that's crazy. Well, <laughs> yeah, I you know, I, I stopped at a master's degree. I knew that I did not want to continue and get a PhD for reasons we can get into because I think you have a similar story. But I, I, I had an idea that I, I could serve a role in a department but it wasn't the traditional role. So I got into geology. I love geology. I love the Pacific Northwest, but I did not love the tenure track research, publish or perish. Uh, I knew that wasn't my, yeah. my scene. How about you? How did you get into geology and why did you stop at a master's degree? Uh, I think I, you know, this, this is great because we haven't had this conversation. So everyone's getting to share this with us in real time. Um, but I think we, we do have a lot of crossover. So, I mean, I, I went to college, didn't know what I wanted to be, wandered into a geology class, third year, physical geology 101, and thought, this is great. I like it. And I took another and another, and then it snowballed. Um, was finishing my bachelor's degree at Weber State. And a professor said, well, what are you going to do now? I'm like, I, I don't know. Like, I was newly married, no kids yet. But like, I don't know what, I don't know how you take this knowledge and turn it into something that pays the bills. And he said, well, have you thought about grad school? And so I said, no, talk to me. And he explained it. And I just loved learning. So it sounded like a good path. And so we went to Northern Arizona University. I worked with Paul Umhofer um, and then got out of there and spent two months unemployed with a pregnant wife uh, in Salt Lake City. She had a great job with the bank and I could not get a job and and forced my way into, there wasn't a position either. My first job was in industry working, doing groundwater work for a consulting company. And I didn't know huh. anything about groundwater. I hadn't even taken a ground, I didn't even take any water classes, but I was a structural geologist. And the guy was like, I need a structural geologist because I can teach, I can teach you water I can't teach structural geology to a hydrogeologist. Right. Um, so, but I think I was in the same boat as you in that I saw my professors in grad school and I saw the rigors and the world that they lived in. And I thought, I don't really want that world for myself. They, a lot of them, just to be kind of blunt, not at home a lot, divorced or not what I would call a productive home life because they had all the pressure of, writing grants, supervising students, generating papers, the publisher parish model, like you said. Um, so while I still wanted to learn and I thought about a PhD, I thought I didn't really want to end up like them per se. Mm -hmm. So I came to teaching later than I was in the consulting job. By this point, we had our daughter. And then um, I started teaching part time at Salt Lake Community College in the evenings, mainly to make an, a little bit extra money. And the first semester, the first week, I'm like, this is what I want to do. Like, I don't want to be at the consulting company anymore. I got to figure out how to make this work. Uh, so taught another semester there, two years with the consulting company and teaching part time, then started sending out resumes. But I looked for openings. I wasn't like you. I wasn't like, I'm just saying, you know, I was like, oh, I got to wait for someone to have an opening to get a job. Yeah. And anyway, got a job in Southern California in the middle of the desert, an awful place um, for two years. That was my first full-time teaching gig and then came here to CSI. So, Wow. Okay. So, all right. Well, let's close the loop on the, the CSI thing then. So yeah, yeah. I want to hear it, that. It was, it was, must have been July of 1992. We say goodbye to our friends in Ohio. We rent a moving van. My parents drive down to meet us at a rest area in Southern Illinois to help us make this big trip out West. Got the baby, got the car, got everything in our worldly possessions in the back of that thing. We get to Pocatello, my wife's family. We unload the truck. This is like mid July, 1992. Right. My first call is to College of Southern Idaho to this guy that I had been exchanging letters with and phone calls with. And it, my memory is he was halftime geography, halftime geology. It was a combined thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, well, okay. I can't remember the guy's name. I should have looked that up to prepare for this. If I said and it, would I you said, know it? 
Maybe. Marvin Strope. Yep, that's it. Yep. Yeah. That's it. So Marvin said, uh, well, I really was impressed with that VHS tape. I even got it to work in my VCR, and I watched the whole thing. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm talking to my people here at the university. We need you here at, at College of Southern Idaho. And so he's, you know, pumping me up. And, and I make that call on Monday morning. We, we, got, we arrived on a weekend in Pocatello. That call on Monday morning. I'll never forget the phone call. And I said, Marvin, I'm in your state now. I'm ready to come over and visit. He said, I got bad news for you. We've decided to go with a geography applicant instead of a geology person. I thought we had it cinched, but we don't. And so I'm curious. I know exactly where this goes, but go ahead. Like, go ahead. No, no. You, you. No, no, no. I want to hear what you're going to say. I interrupted. Like, I want to hear what you're going to say first. No, nah, it, it, I, I was like, hung up the phone and I'm like, what are we going to do? We're out here. My parents were right. They said we were crazy to leave those two full-time <laughs> jobs in Ohio. I'm I'm living in your in your parents' basement with a crying baby. What the hell are we going to do? Yeah, that is a crazy and so, story. And so I came up here to Ellensburg, which was the only other opportunity, and just begged to like get a half-time job to teach some intro labs. She's like, you've got a master's. I'm not going to hire you. To this is Megan Miller and Charlie Rubin who just showed up and they were had grand plans to build a program here. There was hardly anything going on. And she said, I, I can't with good conscience hire a guy for $12,000 for the first year. I have no benefits for you. I have nothing. I'm like, I'll take it. Yeah, I need something. So we, so we showed up, and uh, one thing led to another, and it all it all turned out happily ever after. But who took that job in 1992, <laughs> and when did you show up? What year did you show up? So I showed up. I came here in 2004, and my predecessor was a lady named Nancy Johnson Byler. She was a geographer mainly, but she taught enough geology to make it work. And she apparently, I did. I never knew when she came. I knew she came in the '90s, but that that fills the gap right there. So there's that's, that's a crazy story. So they must have already, and she was a great educator. Um, but they must have already offered it to her, and you were kind of like the backup or something. Or that's I. It was it was like many of those things. It was handled kind of awkwardly, and I I. I don't really remember if there was even an interview scheduled or anything like nothing. You know, I, yeah. I came out, there was no, it was kind of almost like a handshake, wink, wink thing. Right. Like, yeah, we'll take care of you if you can just get out here. But uh, yeah. So they yeah, went with her and times, that's great. Right. That's yeah, crazy. That's right. I, I never knew that. That, that was, if we don't do anything <laughs> else today, there's a nice little nugget that okay. I just got was just the Nick Zentner CSI connection. So yeah, that's crazy. Well, it worked out well for me because Nancy, was older than you would have been in 1992. And I wouldn't be here if you had filled that in because you'd still <laughs> be here and I would, I'd be somewhere else. So it's, it's crazy how these things all work out. That's right. That's incredible. So you came there then as an adjunct or full time. And like what responsibilities were you given initially with that first year or two? Well, to answer that, let's go back for just a sec. So I, I gave a talk, my first talk at a GSA meeting in Spokane in 1989, uh, and they're holding it in Spokane for the yeah. first time since then. Right. So that's a long time ago. Uh, so that was an important meeting for me because Bill Hart from Miami University came up after my little 15-minute talk and said, we're looking for an adjunct person to be a lecturer. And I'm like, I don't even know what an adjunct is. What, what is that? He says, well, we pay you a little bit of money to yeah. basically teach all of our classes because <laughs> we, we got research we want to do. That was a new concept for me in, in the late 80s. And so uh, my job at Miami in Ohio was to attract majors to the program. And I had 400 students every semester, uh, 8 o'clock in the morning, 10 o'clock in the morning. And I had all sorts of practice. Uh, I was just an apprentice, essentially. I and taught a little bit. Of, and you're like late 20s at this point? Like where? Yeah. Okay. So you're, yeah. okay. Yeah. 27. And I I, uh, I was such a, a, a poor student uh, as an undergrad and a grad student that I didn't have a TA uh as a graduate student in Pocatello. So everybody else was talking about TAing in the labs and things. I'm like, well, you know, I'm, I'm just barely here kind of a thing. So I had very limited teaching experience. But like you, 
as soon as I started, I I knew right away that I should be doing this. So like you were kind of you were kind of rudderless too until that first, like, hey, I like geology. This is good stuff, but I don't know where this is going to go. But then you had that first teaching experience, and that kind of like set you on that path. Is that fair? It is fair. I had no, you know, and I tell this to my students now, like they're all worried about what their job is going to be. And I'm like, look, man, I got a master's degree in geology. I had no idea what I was going to do with it. Most of my people in the late 80s, all my buddies all went off to oil and gas. Yeah. El- Elko, Nevada. And, and you know, Carlin was hiring or whatever. The price of gold was really high. And I'm like, I'm not going to live in a trailer. Some I had no idea. I could not visualize anything. But once I discovered that classroom and I don't know. It's just like, it sounds like you had the same moment. You just start and you're like, this isn't easy, but it feels natural. It yeah. feels just like I should be doing this. It's finding and a so, niche, yeah. 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 So I had three three solid years in Ohio just going full bore, practicing, repetition, 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 tweaking, tweaking. And I was able to uh, build a number of students. So there was, you know, a, a lot of majors by the time I left there, and and, uh, and and the people there were very impressed by that. And so that was really the way that I sold myself to Central Washington. I said, if you yeah. hire me, even even as a halftime person, I can be the Pied Piper for you. I can I can I can get students, and I we can get majors, and then you can if. They basically saw that. If if I could do my job and bring a bunch of students in, then they could add a new professor and another new yeah, professor. Yeah, the department grows, that. right. So you were like the you were the Kool-Aid salesman, like, hey students, come try this Kool-Aid. It's really good. Um and giving Pretty them much. that first first taste. Interesting. And that was the first the first ten years of my career was just nothing but I have to justify my job by attracting students and getting them beyond that. Basically, if I can get them into my one-on-one classroom and I take them on a couple field trips or maybe teach a field course down in California or do a spring break trip in desert Southwest or whatever, I was doing a lot of that. Then I can justify me being here. And my parents up until recently have always been worried that I'm not going to be able to keep a job. If I don't have a PhD at a university, they're going to get rid of you. You're going to be expendable. You're not protected. And I'm like, it's working. I, yeah. I think we're okay. I, so. I mean, I, I would I would echo what you said in that as we advise young people, that's the thing I try to reiterate as well is that just go for it. Like, don't, you can't, you can't think six steps ahead to what this is going to look like in 20 years. Like young Nick had no idea. Probably he was even going to stay at central Washington. You probably thought it was a stepping stone and I'll stick somewhere else, but you certainly didn't think you'd end up where you are today. So you can't think that that far ahead. You just need to like have a passion and follow it and see where it takes you. It's an important lesson. And yes, I advise most of our students and have for a long, long time. And I, there's generally two types of students. Uh, so they become majors, in other words. So right. then they're sitting right here in this chair. And some of them are, they say, I'm going to do all this work in geology. Great. But I need a goal. You give me a carrot that I, I'm going to work for. I'm going to bust my ass to get that job. And some are only going to commit themselves if they can see that job. Or maybe it's the parents that say, I don't think I really know what geology is. It doesn't sound like a good choice. But uh, if you can convince me that you can get a job in in, uh, greater Seattle, making some money and driving rush hour traffic, then I'll sign off on this. So some want that motivation. But for the most, I try to convince them just what you said, Sean. This geology stuff is fun. If you're comfortable being outdoors and you're naturally curious and you're not afraid of science, then you just have to have faith that there's going to be some doors opened for you by people that you meet. You just have to be open to opportunities, but you don't have to stress over the specific job. You just yeah. have to bet on yourself. That's it. Just yeah. bet on yourself and work work hard and be open to opportunities. So. It's like sales, really, but it's it's all within the world of geology. So did they give you a, a t- so your adjunct, but then eventually is it lecturer or there's a title or you probably didn't even care at that point because you're just trying to like keep the baby fed and the wife happy and like, but like where, <laughs> and then maybe also speak to, 
and I know where I kind of know the answer to this, but I think it'd be good for the viewers to hear. Yeah. The one big difference between you and I is you are at a university. Your program now has a bachelor's, not 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 just a bachelor's degree, but also a master's degree. Right. Um, whereas I'm at a two year college that ends at an associate's degree. Um, right. I'm the only the geol you're looking at the CSI geology department right now. Right. Whereas you have lots of colleagues. Maybe speak to how that dynamic because I've never experienced that. Like how how does that work? And do you did you always feel and do you still feel like you're second class? There's the PhD big shot research people walking around in your uh, imposter syndrome. Like maybe speak a little bit to that because I'm interested in hearing that. All right. Well, we can go a bunch of different directions with that. We can go dark or we can stay nice and perky and happy. Whatever you want to do, Sean. I'll try to answer it and we'll just go back and forth. Yes, I'd, I... I'd like some dark, just a little. Okay. <laughs> All right. We'll, 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 we'll put a couple sprinkles in. Yeah. Um, especially back then in the 90s, departments didn't have an outreach person or a person who was... Uh, talking to the masses, and then also talking to uh, introductory geology students. It just wasn't a thing. And most people in academia um, play by the rules. There's very specific, rigid rules that have been in existence for 100 years or more. And so at a university with a geology department, and again, when I showed up here 30 plus years ago, there were uh, three gentlemen about to retire and there was this young power couple that showed up from high powered places like Stanford and Caltech and Arizona and places that are way above my, my world. And they showed up here in rural Washington and built this program step by step. Again, I had a role, but um, after two years of being an adjunct for quarter to quarter and paid very, very low wages, and yeah, at the time I was hanging bulletin boards and helping people haul their rocks down the hallway. And it was just basically, I was basically a glorified custodian, essentially. After two years, um, I had a conversation with our department chair and she, and she was very good at making things happen. And I said, well, I've been here two years. Uh, Liz and I want to be here full time. We have already decided this is our place. This is not a stepping stone. We're, we've already dug our, our, our roots in deeply with social and, and other things. And I don't want to leave, but I can't go on with this adjunct thing. So she made it happen and figured out how to get me a state job, which was a scientific instructional technician, just bland uh, state uh, job. But we knew that I was going to be doing all these weird things that didn't fit the actual job description. But she she did me a, a great service by doing that. So there was stability there and I could count on a, a salary every year. And unless there was something unforeseen economically or something else, uh, I'd be fine. And as long as, again, if I, I brought the students in, I'd be fine. So that's that's the answer to that. And I've, right. I've essentially been with that role for my whole career. I, I'm no, I, I, there was a job title change five years ago, but right. it's still. The um, responsibilities not, are the same for the most part. And yet you, you have the your most part. teaching load and your expectations. So the public yes. outreach component is, is not really in there. They, they want you to teach a lot of the introductory classes. That's the gateway drug, right? That gets right. people in. They want you right. to be a huge advocate for the program, almost a recruiter, if you will. Um, right. and, and getting those people into the classes, but also going from the one on one classes to like, okay, now they want to be majors because that's justifying your colleagues, right? If no one's majoring in geology, you just need me and you there teaching one on one for the gen eds, right? So, um, it, so is that, does that sound accurate? It sounds accurate. And so here's the dark portion just, just, just briefly. We'll just okay. touch on it. You can do. Hmm. You can be very good at your job, but if it's an unusual job, it's often overlooked. And so the way I describe it is most everybody here, and really in the ivory towers around the world, 
Right. They're playing. They're playing one board game. They're all. They're all reading the box top and reading those rules over and over and over again. And how do I go from assistant professor to associate professor? And how do I do this? And how do I do that? And all of their attention is on that board game, and it's totally appropriate. That's what the job is. That all their peers, all their friends are in that world, and and that's great. But I wrote my own board game. <laughs> Sure you did. And it inv- and it involves all this other stuff. And so it's unreasonable for me to have people over there at that card table playing that board game to even look up and see what's going on over at my kitty table over there. So uh when it does happen, and Basil Tickoff or others who are deep into the uh regular job and the regular world and the tenure track world, and yet they can also see what guys like you and I are doing, it's especially meaningful. So I have favorite geologists who I have on these broadcasts, and they're good. But to be totally honest, another reason I keep inviting them back is because they actually watch what I'm doing, and and they value it. And so uh, it's, that's not too dark, is it? It's just like- No, that's not dark at all. That's, that's- I, I totally see what you're saying. I mean, the, the your colleagues are so focused on their career path, which has these stepping stones that are laid out before them. And they knew that. They've known that since they were in grad school. Right. That's the game they're playing. You were kind of given this loosey-goosey, enigmatic role, and you're right. grateful for it. But yes. there's no there's no carrots in front of you. There's no stepping stones. So to make yourself grow and challenge yourself you've just kind of made up these other things because you know you're teaching 101 so when did you really start when did you really feel like leaving the classroom and just serving Mm -hmm. the students and like okay now i know there's a market for this beyond this is it people bringing rocks into you and saying is this a meteorite is this what because we all get that um but where where did that happen or how did that evolve when you're like, oh, wow, there's all these people in rural Washington and, and maybe beyond that are interested in geology and I can and here's a method I can take that to them? Uh, pretty much as soon as I arrived in the early 90s, I was surprised at how much interest there was among local folks in geology. Phone calls ringing people coming in off the street. Is this a meteorite? Is this a dinosaur bone? You get it as well. Yeah. So I knew there was an audience there and it was a malnourished audience. Uh, And again, this is before the internet. So everybody is waiting for the next month's National Geographic to see if there's maybe an article on Cascade Volcanoes or something, but, or maybe a Nova special and you're waiting a year and a half for this thing to show up for a half an hour or an hour and then it's gone. So, you know, it, it, I knew there was an audience and it was a malnourished audience and they were wanting more. They didn't hear it in school. We don't teach geology much in this country, uh, K through 12. And so outside of a geology 101 classroom, there just weren't that many opportunities. So to, from my point of view, and I'm curious about your point of view, the audience was there, but it was totally turned on by the internet. The fact that the internet opened this whole world And, you know, it wasn't immediate, but some could see the potential in using the Internet to share detailed stories, geologic stories about their area, and especially out here in the West. And so I knew that was there. And I'm I'm not a business person. I'm I'm afraid of money and (laughs) that getting in the way. But... I, I knew that if I put some energy into that, it would work. And even though I'm at a university, I do view my 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 role as pretty much the same role as you. I do feel pretty isolated and pretty solitary most of the time. Um, do you wish that you had colleagues there, or do you did you ever think that your job would be a stepping stone and you would go on to a bigger place or, or what, what's your take on this part of the story? Um, I mean, in terms of colleagues, it's yes and no, like the autonomy is great. Like I want to use this textbook. There's no committee meeting. I just decide it. Right. Or, or here's what we're going to do. Like, you know, geology department meetings are me and myself and I, and so those are things get done. 
but are there times I wish, you know, I could walk out in the hall and be like, you know, share excitement or things that are happening right. like this Iceland thing. And I've got five chemists down the hall and a physicist. And I mean, you just, we just, we connect, we're nice to each other, but the connections aren't there. Um, yes. And so I think it's a, it's, it's yes and no. Like I wish there were colleagues to share geology with, and I miss like that grad school camaraderie where you're just kind of like yeah. deep in the trenches every day. Yes. Talking about it. Um, but in the end, it's, it's really refreshing and nice to be, and flattering to be like the guy, like, you know, I'm the only geologist most people know in the Twin Falls area. And, and so to be the quote unquote expert in your little tiny neck of the woods is kind of, is neat. And the little local paper wants to talk to you. Um, I mean, so it's, it's the same thing. And I think I got into the outreach similar to you, you get invited uh, by the Kiwanis Club or the right. Rotary or whatever to do a thing. And I, those are always fun. And I'm always like, wow, these people, if only my students would have like the, yeah. the passion yeah. for this and the, the appetite that these people do. And so, I mean, I probably have a similar story to you where it kind of went from one thing to the next and, you know, writing books, mountain press books and whatever, and just looking for like, and then YouTube, right? And then YouTube's like the big, the big platform. Well, yes, we are very similar in that respect. And I think I've shared, I'm realizing right now, I've shared some of this backstory about the university setting and me not uh, being playing the same board game. Because if I'm totally blunt, maybe I'm just speaking for myself, Sean, but I like getting immediate reaction from people who appreciate what I'm doing. Yep. It's it's selfish. It's not some sort of higher goal of I should really spread the word and educate. That's too pretentious. I'm doing it for me, man. And <laughs> as long as I feel like I have a community that I can communicate with, that's it for me. That that drives everything that I'm doing outside of the classroom. And it boils down to just simply wanting that connection. And obviously, this kind of a setup is, what do we have? More than a 1,000 people probably watching? Yeah, 1,300 people watching from around the world. Like, I, I never get over that. And yeah. it feels good. And I'm guessing you have the same core motor for what you're doing, right? I mean, yeah, it's, 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 it's no different than when you're in the classroom and you know the moment when it happens where you're like the students are locked in, something special is taking place and you get the, I call it the warm fuzzies, right? You get the warm fuzzy on the inside. You know, they don't pay us that great, but you know, I don't, you and I don't deal in K-12 education. We don't have to deal with parents and discipline. My wife, right. your wife works at a school. My wife works in a school as a counselor. Oh yeah. I hear the stories and I'm like, oh my gosh, that is not the world. I would last three minutes there, Max. Exactly. Um, but yeah, and, and, and so I think the it is a little selfish because you realize it's the instant appreciation people are enjoying what and that's all we all of us want right we want to be valued we want whatever we share in life to be appreciated and, and make a difference with people and so when you start hearing whether it's the emails the comments or whatever how much you're helping someone understand their area or look at a road cut differently or, or whatever it's it's incredibly like powerful and it, it makes a big difference and it keeps you in the game, you know, like you, and you put out way more stuff than I do. Like, I'm like, where does this guy get the energy? But I know the answer to that question. Part of the energy comes from when you, you do it, that's the fuel that you need for the next time. Cause when, yes. you're, when you're getting ready to do it, you're like, Oh boy, where Liz is like, where are you going today, Nick? Oh, I got to do another, you know, another live stream. And maybe you're not dragging your feet like that. I'm, I'm probably reading into it too much. But, but when you get in the moment and you see the comments and stuff, it's, it's rewarding at that point, knowing you're making a difference. It, it is rewarding, and I think there's a couple other things that work. I'm curious what you have to, to say about it. I, I know that a bunch of the people right here with us right now are fans of geology. That's, that's obvious. Right. But I think it's maybe more than that. I mean, it's been four years that I've been dealing with this live stream business and it started during COVID and, and I'm still trying to totally understand what's going on. But I think in addition to geology, I think people just want to be in a positive space environment. Yeah. 
and and they're proud of themselves. I'm speaking for you now, viewers. You can tell me if I'm way off. You're proud of yourself for selecting to be in a place like this as opposed to other places that are less satisfying or less healthy or less whatever, or less, less positive. So I lean into the really corny stuff about I love you, Sean, and, and all, <laughs> all this, you know, I never used to talk like that, but the the pandemic was such an odd time, and we were all kind of extra emotional, at least I was, and trying to navigate all these weird things that were going on. And I've hung on to a lot of that because this community thing is is undervalued in science. I mean, we're trained to be science people. We're not trained to know understand anything really about psychology and sociology, but uh, just like teaching long ago, if you have reps like you have by now, you know who your audience is. You keep continue to tweak, but it's it's building a genuine, authentic community with respect, as opposed to listen up, everybody. Yeah. I'm the expert. Get your notes pads ready to go. I'm going to preach to you about what you don't know. That's not the way to do it, and you don't do it, and that's why you're so popular. No, I, I agree. It can't be top down. Um, I mean, I'll just echo everything you just said. Like, and I've seen it in the classrooms too. And I think COVID was definitely a, a speed bump, especially with the the younger the kids were teaching the college age students. Um, I start my class the first day. If it's good weather, we go outside and stand in a circle. Let Let's get out of the the rows and columns that the the classroom structure demands, and let's and let's just introductions around the room, a fun fact. Um, on my first test, I have students, I say, there's a bonus question, write down six students' name in this classroom beside yourself. On the second test, I say, give me four students' names and tell me something about them that's not a physical attribute. So you can't say Jimmy has red hair and you know Susie sits in the front row. You got to say, oh, Billy's on the basketball team and Nancy likes horses or whatever. And like, I found that just getting them to like break down those barriers. My wife has a social work degree. So I told as much as the, the more I'm in this game and I think you'll agree with this, I'm teaching geology. The science is important. I'm not diminishing that, but we're just trying to build like people and young yeah. people, especially into like citizens communicate, having better communication skills, like getting to know each other. Just I'm teaching very basic, probably kindergarten lessons in some ways that, that we just they have slipped through the cracks a little bit. It's yeah. life coaching now, right? It is. Yeah, that, that's, that's an added part of it. But you're talking about your effectiveness by being able to deal with a lot of different kinds of people. These are kids from different kinds of families. I know they're all from twin or whatever, but like, yeah, with, with practice, and it, you weren't trained, you didn't get an education degree. I didn't get an education yeah. degree. And so we have just learned by repetition how to uh, be effective with lots of different kinds of people. And I'm willing to bet that that's one of the appeals for our uh, public outreach, that you're good at what you do, you have the science, but it's more than just the science. It's, it's connecting, it's navigating all these different questions and different kinds of things. And people just like that. I'll say one more thing that will get me all emotional, but I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> Basically, what I'm doing is, is, is um, I'm just role modeling or I'm just trying to emulate my parents. My parents were both public school teachers in this small town in Wisconsin. They were both coaches they were well known in the community and every time i went to the grocery store with one of them as a kid it would be like forever until they were done with all these conversations with each person but both of my parents were excellent listeners they gave everyone plenty of attention listening carefully and they were valued mostly because of that i think it wasn't really they were a great coach or something else they just were consistent and they were caring humble people. And I think that's ultimately what is making some of this stuff popular. People want a real person, a genuine person, a human being. And the geology is just icing on the cake. A bonus. Yeah. I think it is. Yeah. I don't know how you feel, but I, I no. to me it's 
it's it's uh, it's way bigger than geology, I think, with especially this live stuff for sure. Yeah. No. And thanks for sharing that about your parents. I think it sounds like they were they were people, they were a people person, right? Like they, whether they were extroverts or introverts or whatever, they they cared about people, they communicated with people, and they didn't take themselves too seriously. I mean, I think right. that's part of it is w- of what you and I both do is like. I'm not the expert. I'm looking at the Iceland data and I'm trying to figure it out and I, and I want to learn. So I learn just as much from my students or my viewers. And I know you do too, as they do from me. And it's just, I think taking that facade down and maybe, I don't know, had you and I got a PhD, could we still have that mindset? I don't know. Maybe. I mean, there's, there's people out there that I think can do it, but, but I think it's harder. I think that the, that board game teaches you to to emphasize certain skills. Okay, you got me going. We're going to go another, and we can cut this off and go to your viewers anytime you want, yeah. but uh, I'm going to go dark again real quick, okay? Do I have permission? Yeah, go go dark, and I'll, I'll say coaches if you're going too dark. <laughs> Higher education is a cult. The yeah. deeper you go into the cult, the more it's tough to get out, the harder it is to get out. And once you're in that cult and in the world of PhDs, you're only listening to people in the cult. And the worst part is, from my point of view, everything in your life is cult members. You don't intersect with the mechanic or the cook or the coach. You, I don't. I never see you at the JV football game. I never see you anywhere in town. What are you doing? You're in the cult. You're in this this ivory tower. Right. And so, if you decide that you're going to be a public outreach person, just at the snap of a finger, oh yeah, I see what Sean Wilsey's doing. I'm I'm a I'm a PhD person. I can do better than that. I'm going to start a YouTube channel. It's not going to work, man, because you don't have any experience with anybody except your own. You married somebody within the work. The whole thing. And so I feel like I've got one foot in the cult and one foot out of the cult. And because of my life experience with lots of different communities, it works. Right. And and people that are so deep into that world, they just can't see it. They don't they don't see the value in this. Blah, blah, blah. No, no, Cutting good. myself off now. No, I'm gonna I'm gonna come this is a perfect segue because I found there you a, go. I found a cool little graphic that want to I want to share real quick. So let me let me pull this oh, yeah, up cuz this is exactly I, um so uh, you know blah 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 I was going to show all sorts of I, you know I know stuff but this is all good. I'm <laughs> I'm happy with where we're at and where we're going. I was going to do Nick Zintner this is your life. Um Go but, ahead. But that's Go okay. Ahead. Well, no, like you know you did you came to the college, you did all these great things. Um I don't think you really want to talk about these but but there's a fun progression here of what you did. You did the two-minute geologies. I mean, it's a, it's kind of cool. It's been cool for me to look this past week in preparation for this at mm-hmm. at your evolution um, and the things you just latched onto, whether it was the public TV channel, uh, the, the PBS shows. And I don't think you necessarily sought these out. I think these came to you. Uh, mm-hmm. the, the podcast, your ability to go interview people and you're, yeah, you're interviewing the professional geologists and the researchers. That's the science that's important, but you're going yes. to people like Randy Lewis a native American who gives everyone a totally different perspective. You're going to people like Chelsea McRaven Feeney, who does the graphic design and actually tells the stories through her visuals in a compelling way. People like Merle Beck, who, you know, has passed now, but people you know aren't going to be with us forever. And let's go capture some of what they can share uh, in the moment. Um, so I'm kind of just catching up with like all the stuff I'd prepared. The COVID thing, I think, you know, if I if I was to write the the story, I think that's really where you kind of hit your stride. Is mm-hmm. it was a terrible time. No one knew what was going to happen, but you innovated and came up with things. And some of it was silly, and we can laugh about it now, like the cozy fort and and duct taping your phone to the top of a ladder. Um, the highlight, of course, of the whole Nick from home thing was this moment for me when I was like, oh, my gosh, there's my book. Yeah. And, and Nick Zentner's <laughs> giving me accolades. So uh. Uh, and then that's evolved into some of the stuff you've done more recently with, you know, talking to Adrian, who deals with rattlesnakes. And I don't know how you 
I don't know what in your brain convinced you it was a good idea to bring 150 people out to a field trip <laughs> and have them bring their chairs, but you, but you made it work and it, it it's pretty impressive all the way through. So I, I was going to spend like, you know, 10 minutes on each of those slides that we just covered quite quickly. Um, but you and I met real quick at 20 yeah. in 2016 at Hell's Canyon. So for those of you watching, there's Nick, the tall guy in the back. Uh, and there's me, the, the guy with the visor on, the silly looking guy. And there's Basil Tikoff. And this is, you know, Western Idaho Shear Zone stuff. And um, so it, you've just been a great mentor to me. But here's here's the thing I wanted to get to. And this is exactly what you were speaking to. So mm -hmm. we've got these sort of concentric rings here. And I didn't make this. This is from Scripps Institute. But there's the scientist, right? Dealing with their science. And there, there's there's the cult-like thing you talked about. They're, they're so insulated in their bubble yes. that they can't see beyond it very well. They can see out to this bubble, the green bubble, the scientific community. They have to go to conferences. They have to pr publish. They might even head out into the orange bubble a little bit. And maybe they have a few connections and networks with industry. Maybe they're, you know, they work with the, the public officials, uh, maybe the educators. But this is where I think historically we've just gone off the rails. And I think you and I see ourselves we're here. We're in the orange bubble. So the pink circles right next to us. And so we're, mm -hmm. we spend time there and, mm -hmm. and we're mobile enough. We can go back over here to the scientists. And, and so I think I am a geologist. You're a geologist at our core by training, by expertise. But I think as I, if I were to look at my career in its entirety, I'm mostly here. This is who I am. Yes. Maybe I talked a lot there. Maybe just give us some of your perspective on any of that well thanks for doing your homework and grabbing those things that was nice of you to do that sean yes looking at this i haven't seen this graphic before but i do like it and i do my i see myself in the orange as well uh, i think what do i think i i don't Okay, so here's a common question that I get, and maybe you do too. Why why aren't there a bunch of you guys? How come that? How come everybody's not doing what you guys are doing? Well, it's a good question, um, but there's a couple main reasons that I see. One is that you have to be self motivated. Just like we were talking, you're not typically going to get tons of people at your institution watching what you're doing because it's so different. Let me ask you right now, Sean, you're at College of Southern Idaho. Do the people in your building watch your stuff? Do the, does anybody at your college, are, are they fans of what you're doing? Um, they're aware they're aware they're well, they're aware. Okay. I work at a great institution um, yeah. My college granted me a sabbatical last semester to go yeah. out and make more geology field videos because I use them in classes. I use them in online classes as a as a learning tool. So they were very can, supportive of that. Um, can we the, do Cochise? I, I want to see you a little bit better. Oh please? yeah, let's. Yeah, we can do that. that in fact, that we're done with the powerpoints. That's it's, okay. It, it's Good. over. So uh, thank you. Yeah. I know you're not a fan of that, so. But I spent so much time preparing those PowerPoints. Doggone it, we were going to do them either way. <laughs> I appreciate it. We can go back to those no, if you want more on some that of those slides. We, we got through yeah. them all. I just wanted to, yeah, so. Yeah, so so I, I think, if you don't mind, yeah. why do you think your efforts, your specifically your YouTube channel, is so powerful, is so popular, is so tangible? Like you have really skyrocketed, at least in the last year, it seems. Yeah. So what, what, with all modesty aside, we're talking about how humility is an important part of this. And that's true. But just for a second, why do you think your efforts have taken on such a life of their own recently? Um, I think, I think partially it's content. If I think, in the case of Iceland, I have a connection to Iceland. Iceland is a place a lot of people are interested in. So I think content yes. and interest is part of it. Um, so that gets you partway there. You know, if it's if we're looking at some obscure Alaska Alaskan volcano and I'm monitoring the minutiae of that, no one even lives near it, no one's heard of it. 
probably falling on mostly deaf ears. So I think okay. content's important. I think, no. I think just your personality, just like this is me. And like, if you were with me last night at a, a little social event with friends, or if you just come watch me be a silly dad with my kids, I'm, I'm, I try to be the same person no matter what. I don't have a lot of facades. I'm pretty much a straight shooter. I try to be honest. If I don't know something, I'll tell you. And of course we all have ego. And I think this is the, everything I'm saying, I think holds true for you. Like per, I think personality is important. I think people have to feel connected to you as a human being, regardless of what you're talking about. Um, so I think, I don't know, just my style and my approach to explaining things, my teaching style resonates with people. I don't get bogged down in fancy terms. If, if we're learning a new term, let's give it some context. I think the jargon is where you lose a lot of people. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like, well, let's keep, let's stay with Iceland for a second. So sure. they can, they can get information about Iceland from a lot of different places. Yes. So why are they, why are they coming to you? I think you and I, our role is science. We're translators. We're, you and I can read the literature. We can talk to the scientists. We can look at the data and we understand it. Our academic trainings prepare us for that. But we also, because, because of the game, the board game you and I have been playing for all these years, we know how to take that and bring it to the public who is smart, who is educated, who is eager yeah. to learn, but doesn't know all the buzzwords and just needs someone to take an extra 30 seconds to explain the cool graph that shows uplift, you know, with the GPS data or whatever. And we're able to bridge that gap, I think. And I don't think it's a special ability that's the Nick Zentner, Sean Wilsey gift that you either get or you don't get. I think we've developed it. I think we we, we recognize it because we're in those two worlds. Um, and it's something, I don't know if I could have done this 20 years ago, like coming out of grad school. I don't, I think I'd been, I was in the, I was in the, the research mode and I was in grad school mode and I liked teaching and I was starting to develop those skills. But if you took young Sean and pl plopped him down right now on this YouTube channel, I don't think he would do very well. I think he would be uncomfortable. I don't think he would have the ability to communicate to the public. And so I needed that time. Why are you a trusted person then? That's a big part of, to me, that's mm -hmm. a big part of it, that you are, you are not, you don't have an agenda. You're not trying to manipulate a story for your personal gain. It does not appear. I mean, you can break news right now and say that it is all uh, for personal gain. <laughs> right. But but yes, you would have been uncomfortable 20 years ago, but you're you're making this look easy, and yet you're flying a freaking drone at the same time, <laughs> monitoring a live chat, doing these other things, and yeah. you're and you're you're being vulnerable it takes balls to get on here and just do this thing live especially with what you were doing with some of those real-time eruption things can you speak to that like just the ability to be live with all of this current stuff that's why i think you are the go-to person it's well, live it's current and you are synthesizing in real time hardly anybody can do that i can't do that well i think you can and i'd like to hear your answer to this because everything you ask me I, you know i can ask you i i i don't know i just i it's just a genuine desire to learn it's not taking yourself too seriously it's being vulnerable like you said like i'm yeah i screw up like and i think that's my approach in life is I'm a goofball. Like I'm, you know, I'm, <laughs> I screw up every day all the time with things and I want to learn and I want to get better. Um, and I'm not coming in with, with any sort of agenda other than I, I want to learn. I want people to feel respected and valued. And I want people to feel like their questions are heard. Um, and that I give them some credence, I suppose. I don't know. What are your thoughts with that? Cause it's all, it, it works for you as well. I think. Well, I want to talk more about you. I, 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 you're not sensationalized. No, I'm really you, careful with, I hate, so things I hate about the YouTube world, making the stupid thumbnails. <laughs> I, and initially I did like you, and it's just like, 
YouTube generates three random screenshots during the thing. You pick the one that looks okay and you throw it on there. But in order to grow the channel and like spread the geology educational love and grow the community, you know, I feel like you have to play the game a little bit and like make the thumbnail with the title on it. But I don't want to be clickbait. I don't want to be sensationalism. I want to, and actually yesterday was a good example. When I first got in the office and all the earthquakes were happening and it looked like there was going to be an eruption, I made a thumbnail with a title that suggested an eruption was very likely. Because at that point, that's, that's exactly what it looked like. That There was no dishonesty there. But after I did the live stream and we kind of like everything kind of settled down, I thought eh, that that wasn't really accurate. So I went back and changed it. And oh, I, wow. Really? Yeah. I went back and I'm like, I, I don't want to be that guy. And I that hate says it all right there. Well, I, you know, like so I want people to be attracted to the videos because I think I have something to share and I think they might enjoy it. But not at the expense of like and I hate sensationalism. And I know you do, too. Just like, you know, we can put Yellowstone in the title of a video. And that'll get people there. But I don't want it to be like overhyped because I, I hate that. I hate that about our world. So, I well, know. I got a quick story about that and it might be interesting. And then again, whenever you want to go to the viewers. Yeah, uh, maybe. Questions, yeah, maybe uh, in the next five minutes, 10 minutes, or five minutes sure. or so. Yeah, that would be good. So we're, we're kind of getting into uh, thumbnails and sensational and growing an audience and all of that. We might have different views on this. I'm not sure, but here's my view. Sure. I made I made these when I started doing YouTube stuff specifically for YouTube. It was with a guy named Tom Foster who um, passed away suddenly four years ago this week. I just realized driving in here. So um, four years ago he's been gone, but he and I made uh, these videos. Uh, we started with a series called Two Minute Geology, and then some of those got a little bit longer and longer and Tom was very good with a camera and and was very talented in many ways and he did it totally on the weekends he was not in science or ag he was a he was a plant manager for Twin City Foods uh, in 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 Pasco so he was just a self-taught brilliant guy but a solitary guy and everything else so he basically said Let's make some videos together. You're pretty good in front of a camera. I've seen some of your stuff on, you know, the downtown lectures and all that. And uh, here are the things I can do with a camera. And I said, oh, that sounds fun. Let's just, you know, every Saturday, let's go out and just make some things together. It became clear very quickly that Tom wanted to make sure that his videos that we made together were very, very popular. And he was doing everything he could to, this is like more than 10 years ago, reading all these forums on how to make your YouTube yeah. video popular. And don't, he picked two minute geology because he said, nobody's going to watch more than two minutes. He was just by the book and like just obsessed about numbers of views and that sort of thing. And pretty early on, I said, I don't care about view numbers, Tom. I just like making this with you. And he basically said, I don't want to do it unless it's hugely <laughs> popular. Right. And so that we never saw eye to eye on those two things. But because of my back backstory or even baggage, I guess you can say, with you know not getting a lot of attention uh, in my daily job, uh, I am wired to just enjoy doing the thing. And it really honestly does not matter to me how many subscribers or anything right. else. And yes, I just, the, the money thing, I just keep, I just don't want to deal with that at all. And so I don't, I'm worried about burnout. And so I just, I want to do things when I'm excited about doing them and I don't owe anybody anything and I can just kind of be freelancing about it. Do you because you do deal with money a little bit. Yeah. Are you hoping to continue? Do you pay attention to views or, you know, it's yeah. totally fine. No, no, I'm, I'm the let's, weird one. No, no, let's be honest. And I, I totally respect that about you. And you and I haven't had this conversation before about like right. the YouTube world and the finances of it or whatever. Early on when I was, when my channel was just getting started and, and I'm, it was just kind of a fun thing to do. 2020, I was, you know, I was starting to do these field-based videos 
and I'm like, this this could be good. This this is something because at the time you didn't have a lot of those. So I thought this is something different than what Nick's doing. Nick, Nick has lectures. He has his his two minute geology ones, and some of those are in the field. But I'm going to go to all these other places. And Nick is also very much Pacific Northwest focused. And I thought, well, there's all, I don't know Pacific Northwest geology that well, at least that area. I'm going to go look at all these other places. I'm going to go take people to outcrops and in the field. And so early on, um, you know, it was growing very slowly. But I could see, I saw that once you got to a thousand subscribers, you could monetize your channel. And it was just a goal. It was like, that would be cool just to like, not to get to the money, but like as just a fun goal, like, can I get to a thousand subscribers? That would be, and I remember having like a hundred and thinking like, oh my gosh, a hundred people actually care about what I'm doing. Right. And, and so, you know, I got to the thousand and I thought I had to have like a long, hard look in the mirror by, okay, like, what are you going to do now? What, what's your goal? And I thought, well, huh. One thing I don't want to do is I hate, I absolutely hate watching a YouTube video and halfway through it, an ad comes on. Like yeah. I still, to this day, it just, you know, if I'm showing one to students, like, oh, we have to sit here for five seconds, students, just bear with me. So um, even though I chose to monetize the videos, I disabled that function. So on my videos, there's no mid roll ad that comes up. But ultimately, I decided, yeah, like th these are taking time. I have to leave the family to go do these. Um, there, it's effort required on my part. And we sort of live in a world where it's, you know, if I want to read National Geographic, you pay a subscription. If I want to watch Netflix shows, you pay a subscription. YouTube subscriptions are free, but it was a way for me to to generate a little bit of extra revenue to go to these places to like actually yeah. fund it. And so um, for me, it's like not necessarily like trying to make the money. I think if you're in it for the money, you're going to burn out if you're in it. Yes. And, and if you're just in it, if you're always thinking about the next video and I got to put something up today, you're going to burn out. Lately, I've had a lot of content because of the you Iceland have. thing. Well, it, it's you Iceland. Have. It's 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 Iceland and people and then not just feeling obligated to to give people, quote unquote, what they want, but me wanting to do it. I'm going to go look at the data anyway because I'm curious. Right. I'm going to go I'm going to go see what's happening in Iceland. Yeah. And so it's not much extra work to just share that with people. And and now I've got a community like you do and it's they want to know and they want to hear my take on things and and I want to hear their take on things. And so um so I think I've hit a pretty happy medium, but it's not the driver. Um is it is it giving my family and I a little bit of extra income that we haven't had? Yes. And that's nice. Like, you know, and, you know, teaching, as you know, doesn't, it's lean. I mean, there were years the Wilsey family was like, here it is. And we've got one vacation this year. And right. and who's collecting, let's get the coupons cut out of the newspaper. Cause we're, we're going, you know, and I don't yeah. want to get too deep into this, but, um, but yeah, but it, but it is nice. And um, to have that little bit of extra and, and then to be able to help Amanda Joe and other people with, you know, with, the, the people helping me out as well. I've got Chelsea working on like some logos and some stuff for me. I'm like, but, but it's not about that. It's never been about yeah. that. So. Well, it's, it's just a final thought on that. Uh, thanks for your transparency there. I've yeah. just nice to hear those comments. Um, I may be off on this, but I think, people also respond to the fact that we are not copycats. We're not following trends necessarily. We're not mimicking or parroting the latest flavor of the month with whatever you're supposed to do. I take pride in the fact that, you know, I watch your stuff and I watch a couple other things, but for the most part, I'm just doing it the way I want to do it. I'm a completely unique, original person. And some people are confused by that. Like, what what is this all about? But most people are like, okay, this is different. I kind of like it. Like, this guy is really just kind of doing his own thing. And that, I think it even speaks to the business people. It's kind of an independent entrepreneur thing. And I'm not, I'm, again, afraid of the money thing, but the spirit of just kind of pushing myself and learning how to do new things as you have done as well. I think that's inspiring to some people. Like this person's yeah. not just finding a formula and just doing it over and over and over again. In a way it's like being a musician or something. You're just constantly pushing to the next 
Yeah. Well, it's, 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 it's authenticity, right? It's just, yeah. and you know, I, I did, I too realized like, I don't want sponsorships or the Patreon accounts and stuff. Like I, you know, if people want to donate great like that. Thank you. Um, but it's not required. And I want to yeah. pursue the things I want to do. I've had people say, Hey, yes. I want you to, I'll pay you to come to this place and do videos on this thing. And I'm like, wow, that, that would be, the money would be nice. But I'm like, I don't really want to go there or, you know, whatever the, yeah. I, I'm not, I'm not interested in that. So for now, I think you and I have both figured out these, these niches where we can coexist and there's other people doing it as well, that we're providing something to the public. We're communicating with the public and we're doing it on our terms and in the way we want to. And that's, I mean, right now that that's sustaining me and that feels right. And if that ever changes, then maybe something changes. And I, I think you probably feel the same. I do. Well, you're doing a great job. Yeah. You know that, but it's nice to hear it every once in a while. And I'm oh, sure thanks. you hear it a lot virtually, but you're doing a great job. Keep going. Yeah. It's still, you know, just figuring it out as I go, making it up. <laughs> so, well, great. Um, that's, that was a great conversation, Nick. And, and I did focus on you. I'd have no idea what was happening on the live chat and I followed, followed your advice there. Um, but let's see. It looks like I've got some questions from Amanda Joe, and I know we won't, we won't be able to get to all of these. Um, and we can do these maybe pretty quickly, Nick. There's maybe uh, eight or ten questions on this first page, and I told her to send two pages. So let's let's kind of go rapid fire. So the first question, sure. uh, and I'll just read them rather than pull them up on the screen. I don't think that's beneficial. So from uh, JMS for both of us it says please discuss clickbait YouTube videos with questionable science content <laughs> uh, I'll let you go first it's on purpose that I don't go looking at a bunch of other people's stuff because quite often it's disturbing to me quite frankly so it uh I think Sean has stronger feelings than I do on this, but my coping mechanism to a lots of clickbait type things that are pseudoscientific and purposely misleading, uh, my coping mechanism is just to ignore it. And I, I, I know that that's probably not the best thing to do for the greater good, but I'm back to thinking about keeping my engine going that yeah. just dismantles any positive energy. If I know that I'm doing something and I'm reaching a thousand people live, and then I see some of these where there's 7.5 million views, it's like, why even bother? So I just, I just pretend it doesn't exist. Sean? I agree. I try to do that. Um, <laughs> and I'm getting better because when you, when you go to the place mentally where you give that some of your bandwidth and, and, and focus, it's just it takes the wind out of your sails. So there's yeah. there's all sorts of pseudoscience stuff out there, um, and it it hurts me because I can see I can see through it. I I have the knowledge to be like okay this they're off their rocker, but I know that they're sprinkling in enough science and making it sexy that it's misleading to the public. And that doesn't mean that the public isn't smart enough, but they're seeing stuff that looks, if it looks like a duck and it talks like a duck, right? You know, or whatever the phrase is. And so they're thinking it's it's legit science. Um, and I could mention several channels now, but I won't. Um, yeah, so I, I, I ignore it too. I'm, I guess I'm aware of it. I do check it out from time to time. Um, whenever someone comments something about it or if they post a link to it, I delete it because it's my channel and I feel like I have the right to dictate what is there. Um, I think it's it's messy and probably a bigger topic we could discuss at some other time if we wanted to. Yeah. But um, yeah, that's my approach too. So um, Thank you. Okay, here's something a little lighter. So I like this. From Eminem, for both of us, what are our favorite geology movies? And they mentioned a few like Dante's Peak, Volcano, San Andreas, et cetera. So I'll let you go first on that one. Uh, I'm going to have a disappointing answer. I didn't go to any of those movies because I kept hearing about all this crazy stuff. And I view it the same way that we just talked about with the last question. It's just bothering. It's just bothersome to me. So like a river runs through it or something is about as pure and as, as beautiful a film as I can think of immediately that to me is what geology is about. But these other things that you just mentioned, those those titles, I didn't even watch. So you've so. never seen like a pop culture no. 
science disaster type movie from the 70s, 80s, 90s or any era? Like none? Like not it's not my genre anyway. Okay. Well, give me a couple from the 70s or 80s maybe um, I watched it. Um there's uh there was a movie, oh shoot, I used to have a whole list. So I have a teach a disasters class and that was one of the assignments I had the students do is to watch oh, really? one of these movies and then critique it scientifically like what's wrong and why like why did they you know um so there's huh. um shoot what are some from the 70s 80s like the like well, there's like, twister i mean there's uh there's dante's yeah. Peak volcano um there was one with uh sean connery called meteor from the 70s i think it was 76 i mean some of these are obscure like these aren't like oscar winners right but right okay no, um, yeah, for whatever reason, I still, you know, yeah, for a while there, what was the the core and Dante's Peak and a few others in the '90s, I think, or yeah. whatever. I just like eh, they go God. through cycles. I think of yeah. Someone I, mentioned I saw uh, when time ran out. That was one from the '70s. Paul Newman was in that one. Um, yeah, I'll I'll answer. I guess um, there. I think Dante's Peak had they actually hired a USGS consultant on the set. So even though there's things wrong about that movie. Like it shows it erupting fluid pohoihoi lava and ash simultaneously. Um, there's things wrong with that. At least they like tried a little bit. The movie Volcano is is awful. Like there's some that are just awful. And they're, we actually got together sometimes in grad school, me and some buddies, and we'd throw one on, you know, people just chilling out at someone's house. And, and that was, it was comedy. It was, we were watching it as if it was like an SNL skit or something, so. Interesting. That's well, an interesting it, fact about yeah. you. Yeah, just just no interest. Interesting. Okay, well, much respect there. Um, all right, Oscar M. wants to know f uh, for both of us, what is the most controversial geology discussion today? I'm drawing a blank, so if you have something, go. Well, I mean, discussion is the key word. Like, is it really a discussion, or is it just shouting back and forth? So, yeah, yeah I mean, my whole career, I've had students come up to me after the first lecture in 101 and say, listen, I don't, I need to pull you aside. I need to tell you, I don't believe that the Earth is 4.6 billion years ago. And uh, I say, okay, well, thanks for not interrupting the lecture. Let's go back to my office and talk about it. It's not a discussion. Yeah. It's not a discussion. Right. To have a discussion, you need two open people who are willing to listen to the other people. So, um, so Oscar, I don't know, uh, age of the earth. Uh, yeah, there's hot columns. button topics, right? There's hot button topics in, in geology, for sure. So that's where my mind goes. Where does your mind go when, when Oscar asks about a... I mean, I was thinking more like, you know, what caused basin and range extension, some of the deeper stuff, oh. but... But but yeah. but your point's a good one is that um, definitely teaching classes, age of the earth, um, and you know even somewhat like processes and I, I just tell students straight up like you took a geology class, um, if this class's content infringes upon your belief system, th that's for you to reconcile. Um, science is not about belief systems; it's about what we can observe and our understanding yeah. of the natural plant you know earth and and nature and i don't know so yeah hopefully oscar maybe that helped a little bit but i don't know well you studied with paul umhofer and paul umhofer was deep into the baja bc world and yeah. so there's an example where it should be a conversation among every geologist in the american west but again if we're taking a dark uh, version of it most are not following any other discussions if it doesn't involve their research. And so even something as stimulating as did a piece of Mexico end up in the Pacific Northwest, you'd think everybody would want to t chime in on something like that. But those kinds of open discussions are rare. It takes trust and right. a willingness to have a three-dimensional conversation, and most are too busy to do that. Yeah, and just last thing, we don't need to spend too much time on it, but we feel like we've progress as scientists, you know, like the days of J. Harlan Bretz and that resistance to those observations and that interpretation. Like we think in a hundred years, we've like, we're in a better place, but we're not <laughs> like we're, we're, we're still, it's probably getting better. I'd like to think so, but there's still people entrenched in their, you know, um, their conclusions, what their interpretation of the data is and until we get out of those silos and start mixing it just it kind of stays that way so mm -hmm. yeah 
Good question, Oscar. It probably wasn't a good answer, but we tried there. Um, <laughs> Helen the Scottish Llama. That's a great little title there. Wants to know, can you see any citizen science projects in geology, or do you believe they will mainly be of use in ecology biology? Um, not sure what she refers to by citizen science projects in geology. Any thoughts there? Well, or? Sure, I think I know what she's talking about okay. or he's talking about. Um, this past winter, I did a series of live streams and I decided I was going to try to lean on the viewers for all sorts of independent research by them, hmm. mostly looking for historical documents and old photos and even finding papers that we didn't know about. And that to me is citizen science, that we've got folks who are engaged by what we're doing and just continuing to just kind of thinking about those things and doing their own work. And if there's not a forum for it, they just send us stuff or they do their own field trip or, or something like that. So that's how I view citizen science. And sure, almost anything that Sean is talking about, there, there's plenty of talent out there, as you well know, Sean. And um, to me, that's a current interest of how I can continue to not only have live viewers absorbing what I'm interested in, but how I can engage them and have them be part of a living community. That hasn't been done much before. And I, it was an experiment this past winter, and I think it worked quite well. Yeah, no, I think I got, I get, thanks for explaining it better. I just didn't get the question right away. And then, and now, and now that you've explained it and thinking about it, my, my dad, who's retired, lives on Whidbey Island. He's in Oak Harbor and he is a volunteer citizen scientist with some, it's affiliated with the university, but he goes out to the beaches because he likes doing that with his wife and walking the beaches, but they actually collect data about like, you know, where, you know, the, the tide and like where the, the, yeah. the, the, you know, after a storm it has the sediment been eroded and the bare rocks exposed and erosion. Uh, and he just like makes, he has his little check sheet that he like, and he's just making observations. So I think citizen science for observations um, has definitely gotten better and is improving a lot as well. Just having those people looking at something because the more eyes are on something, the more data you have. Well, it's right back to the themes we were talking about an hour ago. Do you respect the people that are out there? Right. Oh, they don't have they don't have a master's degree in geology. They don't. Well, then they obviously are of They're no not use to us. Right. Yeah. Come on, man, get over yourself. What are yeah. you talking about? They're smart people who have uh, they 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 are engaged. Somebody has lit a fire under them, and they want to go. And yeah. they've got, you know, we got a lot of old people with with time and money. They're willing to help out. They want to help right. out. So let's let's figure out how we can get that citizen engagement and propel the science, as opposed to just talking to everybody like they're third graders. Yeah, I mean that might be, and I'm sure some people have figured that out. But that might be the next venture in like the science public thing is like they're getting the researchers and the public and the common denominator is the data right like hey we need we need lots of data points on this glacier or this stream or whatever it is and you've got people in that community that can go out and collect and then they have that purpose and then they're feeling like they're contributing and it, it's win-win right so it is. yeah no thanks for that question um let's see I'm kind of picking and choosing a little bit here. There's a couple from about Iceland that I think I can handle some other time. Um, yeah, someone asking about if we know a geologist YouTubing in Southern Illinois or the Ozarks. I don't know anyone. That's from Charles W. Uh, let's go to the next page of questions real quick here. And thanks for sticking around with this, Nick. Much appreciated. This is fun. Thanks for the invite. Yep. We'll go just a little bit further and then we'll wrap this up. Um, yeah, a lot of them are just asking like some basic geology questions. I'd like to kind of stick with the theme we're on here. Here we go from uh, Wadoid. So basically, what can I do with the geology degree that can make me a living, not including being a teacher? Nick Zentner, you're on. Well, young person, you're interested in geology. Okay, well, let me give you the spiel then. There are all these opportunities for you. Here is a website, young person, 
all the graduates of our program, and I've had them contact me and describe in a couple of paragraphs what their job is. And you will notice, young person, if you take the time to go to that website, that there's people working in an urban environment, they're making way more money than I am, they're driving in rush hour traffic every day, they're doing groundwater consulting, they're doing slope stability, they're working for Department of Transportation, or they're in a private firm, and they're happy doing that. And they're happy doing that with getting a basic geology degree from this university, either a bachelor's degree or a master's degree, but we have our geology degrees as broad as possible so that you can go all those directions. If that doesn't sound good to you, then yeah, you can have a completely different lifestyle and you're out in the middle of God knows where in Wyoming and you're making a geologic map and you're mapping quad after quad or now you're looking for important resources that have been overlooked for 150 years. That person who's living in a tent got the same training as that person in uh, Tigard, Oregon, driving in in their Porsche every day. So that's examples of how you can go different directions. My brother-in-law and I both went to Idaho State University, both got master's degrees at the same time, both Okay, so we both married two girls from the same family. Okay, great. He went back home in Cincinnati, did the suburban lifestyle, quite wealthy, consultant. I chose teaching. We took the same classes. We both did a master's thesis on the Snake River Plain. Those are the possibilities. You just have to be open and willing to go in all those directions, and all those jobs are available. I'd tell you. If it's art history and there's no jobs, I would tell you there's no work out there. There's tons of work, but you just have to have faith that it's going to happen for you. Now let's go out there and get them, okay? Woohoo! There's the rally speech right there. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even add much to that. That's great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think um, there's a lot of pathways. I always like to start with students that are asking this question, like, what are your goals in life? Oh, you want to live in Twin Falls, Idaho till till you die? Okay, like here, you know, how many geologists live in this, you know, 50 mile radius area? Like there's three of us, right? It's pretty, it's slim pickings, you know? How much is money an important goal in your life? Like, do you want to have a very affluent lifestyle? Okay, let's have that conversation. What do you want to do? I really think everything comes down to like, um, in terms of just happiness, it's like your, your job satisfaction, if you enjoy what you do, if you're comfortable with the wage and the compensation that you're given, if you like your lifestyle and the, or excuse me, the location that you're in, like I like living here. And then the other thing is your, your environment, your work environment. So who you mm. work with, you know, maybe the, your higher ups, if there are any, that sort of thing. If you generally, if those four things are pretty much um, satisfactory, people really enjoy their, their careers. But when one of those things is out of whack, that's when people start looking elsewhere. I totally agree with that. And I think in addition, it's a revelation that you can have a job that's also something you would be doing on your own time. Like you're, it's basically your hobby, mm -hmm. and yet you're also being paid to do it. That seems to not work for most people's brains. And I don't know about you, Sean, but I get a lot of regret from viewers, whether it's by email or in the live chat, even like, boy, I, I, if I had, if I had figured or if I had discovered this geology thing long ago, why didn't I just go in that direction? Like I spent 40 years doing that and I hated it and I could have done this job. These guys seem to be having a great time doing all this stuff out in the middle of nowhere. And so if that's a goal to like have a job, that's also something you would do anyway, um, it works in our cases for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's, you know, and you can't live your life looking back like that. Um, and I tell people too, with geology, I'm like, geology can be an amazing career and profession. It can also just be a fun hobby, right? Like I'm going to go outside, I'm going to learn on my own. I'm going to collect rocks or do whatever. Um, and sometimes I had to advise students, like, it sounds like the things you want out of life and this geology degree might not be that compatible, um, you know, that you might need to pursue this more as a hobby. But yeah, I hear from the same viewers that they wish, 
you know, they, but, but the nice thing is they can do it now, right? They can, they right. can, they can come in now. We'll take you from at whatever age, wherever you're at, um, knowledge wise and, and just start learning and be curious. I think that's the most important thing. So there's all sorts of pathways that you can follow there. So, um, hopefully that, that was good. That was, uh, I lost the question there. Oh, uh, Wadoid. Um, Keith Dowsett, have you guys realized you already formed your own E Department of Online Geological Outreach? Um, I guess so. I mean, like I, I, I was lucky enough to see you, Nick, already kind of like trailblazing that path ahead of me and knowing I had a passion for public outreach and doing and doing the same sort of thing, but realizing I didn't want to do I don't want to be Nick Zentner and you don't probably don't want me to be Nick Zentner anyway, but I could do something else on my own. And I contacted you early on. I don't know if you remember that email from many years ago where I was trying to get my name out a little bit and get some clout. And I, but I didn't want to you to feel like I was stepping on your toes. Um, but I saw a world where we could both coexist. And now there's, you know, there's Myron Cook and there's other people out there doing, doing great things. And I think, the niche is there and I don't think there's, it, it needs to be under one domain or one person. I think. It, it, it doesn't. It, you've, you've, you've done a beautiful job and yes, many, many more could be doing this, but I don't think that's happening. Maybe for a few reasons. I think I tried to say this an hour ago. Let me try again right now. What do you need in my opinion, after doing this for a, a few years now? I think you have to be productive. I, I don't think you can do this for like six months and make a bunch of stuff and then go, well, I, I, I can put that on my resume. Like I'm on to the next little challenge. No, no, no. You, you, are you in this or not? And if you're in this, you keep yourself fresh, but you are in it for the long term and it is part of you. So that's a big part of it. These other things we we're talking about, the tone has to be right and such and such. But also just to, the you know I've been kind of negative about where I work, and I don't mean that to be the lasting message. I have been given this freedom, this academic freedom, to pursue my interests. So it's possible to pursue what interests me because of this job that I have. So you know I go home sometimes and whine to my wife, and she says, "You can't expect you just to go off and do all your own stuff, and then expect everybody to give you a standing ovation every time you walk into the building. What are you doing? Wake up!" Yeah, <laughs> and she's right. And so, are there other people who have our jobs, or can it be done by a total amateur person to the point where you can have the credibility and all these things that we're doing? I don't know. But yeah, the list is pretty short, isn't it? Yeah. Like it's the two of us. It's Myron and I, maybe Callan Bentley a little bit on the East Coast. Yeah. And I, where are the women? Where are the, where are the minorities? Uh, there could be so many more voices out there. Um, but I guess you need a certain. Uh, well, it's not easy. It, you know, like, what are, what are we doing right now, Nick? It's Sunday morning. <laughs> then we're, you know, like it's what was I doing yesterday? I was at breakfast with some friends, and then I came right to the office to to do a live yeah. stream on Iceland. And yeah. again, not for obligation, because I wanted to. I'm like, oh, Iceland's erupting. That's exciting. I want to be a part of that. I want to share that with people. Um, and so it's you know, and if we if you and I had oil and gas jobs in industry. I don't know if I've had if I would have the interest, the bandwidth, the time, the energy, the, the motivation time. Right. to do this. But but we in the academic world there is a lot of flexibility. You teach your classes, you're there for your student, and because you and I are not tenure track research professors, it's like, well, what do I, what else can I do? And for us, I think this has been the low hanging fruit we pursued. It's a good point. Uh, I don't think it's an accident. We're both uh, past. Well, I don't know. I'm 61. How old are you, Sean? 51. 51. Mm -hmm. So we've raised our kids. We've gone through that phase. Uh, I started doing all this stuff because my kids didn't want to hang out with me anymore. And I was <laughs> like, what else What else am I going to do? I, right. you know, I was a full-time like parent for for a good 15 years. And then suddenly, like, the I got to find something yeah, else. Right. <laughs> and, and so, yeah, I, I was looking for a new challenge. 
Uh, and, and that's a big part of this. So it's easy to say, where, where's the 31-year-old? Why aren't they doing all this? Well, they're trying to build a career. They're trying to well, maintain they're sur- this Well, they're in job. survival mode. Like I, at 31, yes. I was like, I'm like, I got to do my job, but like my wife needs me for this and my kids need me for that. And, and I think there's, right. there's a sweet spot in your life where it works better than, than other times. And we were not only busy with, you know, parenting and our day job, but our day job was practicing, talking, uh, mastering, mastering, but, but having practice in communicating geology and that word business is, I think, underappreciated or maybe not recognized. And I, I try not to ever talk about what I'm doing with on my channel. This is rare for me to comment on all this stuff but i think the ability for us to just use our words and do it effortlessly that only really comes from 20 plus years of daily practice to just kind of just you gotta get the reps in you gotta get the reps in for sure like it like anything yeah Yeah. so well if we are an e-department of online geologic outreach (laughs) then that's great. I, I'll let Nick be the department head. I don't want to do that. So, <laughs> um, Here's a question from Charlie Mitchell. I guess it's for both of us. Do you have plans for outreach geared to younger people, high school and junior high? Um, I'll start. I, I When I started mine, I thought about doing something for kids. Uh, and now I see there's actually a geologist. He's at like, he's on the East Coast, maybe Boston University or somewhere in that region that has a, I think it's like, what's it called? Like all rocks have stories. There's a name for it. And he's doing something Mm. geared for kids and he's doing great work. Um, So I don't, I don't have any plans for, I think what I do and I think what you do is accessible and should be accessible to adolescents. Um, You know, there's no age requirement here. Our communication styles maybe don't fit well with the eight-year-olds um, right now. But I've had viewers tell me, yeah, my, my, I'm watching this with my 13-year-old. I have people coming to my field trip with their teenage kids. So I know it can work. What are your thoughts? Uh, it's back to the Tom Foster collaboration where Tom was trying to play by the rules and make just the perfect video for a certain audience. And it goes back to that for me. So this is 15 years ago. I'm just like, I just want to make stuff that pleases me. And if it's out there and it's yeah. free and open to anybody, then anybody can use it. And yes, I've learned, I've heard from five-year-olds all the way up to 95-year-olds. They're they're really into, into what's going on. If it's done well, it will work right. for all the audiences. So I personally, I don't think of, I, I need to make videos specifically. Even, even the two-minute thing where I said, hello, young people, I wasn't really thinking about, I was <laughs> doing this for elementary school people. I just thought it was kind of a yeah. dorky way to start. Yeah, no, I agree. It's, 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 you pick your bandwidth and your message, you put it out there and it sticks where it sticks. And put it out there. Yeah, if, and it just lands where it lands. So, okay, a couple more questions. We'll wrap this up here soon. Um, JMS wants to know, please discuss the role of social media in teaching geology like this chat or Discord or so- similar sites. Um, I don't have any experience with Discord. Someone invited me onto it. I guess it's where people, you chat about a certain theme. I haven't actually gone on to that. Social media... I mean, YouTube is social media, so I think you and I are using that as our primary platform. But as I've gotten busier here, I used the Facebook Facebook a lot more early when I was trying to promote things. And now that I, I, you know, I'm staying this busy, I'm not doing as much on any other channels. I know you still occasionally put out a Facebook like, hey, here's a new video. But what are your thoughts about that question or that topic? Uh, I'm a user of social media personally. I, I, I'm on Twitter or X as it's now called and Instagram and Facebook. Um, I am not making any stuff specifically for those um, forums. Uh, yeah, I still, if I make a video that I like, I'll, I'll include the link on those three channels just to kind of let people know what's going on. But it's the same philosophy. Uh, it's mainly YouTube that I'm operating in. And then if it's shared and, and spread, uh, and it's free and open for anybody to enjoy. 
for me personally, nothing's copywritten or anything. It's like, you want to take what I've done and, and use it somehow by, yeah. by all means. And, yeah. and it's, I've never had a problem with, with anybody, uh, you know, totally manipulating what I've done. So, uh, yeah, social media, I've, I've not been on discord either. I refuse to try Tinder. That's a whole, uh, <laughs> sorry, not Tinder. Well, Tinder I'm and, telling Liz. Uh, <laughs> Not to oh. say TikTok, you meant but we got to edit that part out. You meant Twitter, um, which is now X, right? No, I meant TikTok. Oh, TikTok, yeah, yeah. I don't. Know but maybe I should either. look into Tinder. Uh, that's that gives me an idea. I, I'm always forward looking. I'm going to try something on Tinder, everybody. <laughs> okay, that's I, I am announcing that right now. Swiping <laughs> right to the next. Stay, okay, stay tuned. Oh my gosh, that would be great. Yep. Who's this geology guy on Tinder? I'm matching with him. Woo. He's kind of good looking. Yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see, um, you know, like 10 years from now, will this still be a dominant platform or will we be on something else? So, you know, if you and I are going to keep doing this, we're going to have to evolve like we have and find some other platform. Um, so we'll just have to see. Um, I look, it's a good point. I look forward to that. Uh, yeah. For sure, there'll be new things coming, and you know, I'm I'm not a young person, but uh, it's another thing. I'm relying on the live audience to help me navigate these new things, and I'm continuing to just kind of plot along and teach myself things. So yes, it's easy to say that five, ten years from now there'll be a whole new operation. Right. I hope we're we're part of that too. That that'll be a fun challenge. Yeah, because you have to kind of adapt, it. and you've been good about like. Okay, I don't know how this. Even just a few months ago, you didn't know how Zoom worked. I I, right. I think I saw you test your very first or nearly your first new Zoom thing, but you figured it out. You just need you know yeah. someone to kind of work through it, trial and error. So, um, yeah. okay, let's do maybe a cut. Let's see. Let me cherry pick maybe two or three of these questions. Um, do you think this is from Kate Bat? Do you think the public has a general hunger for lifelong learning? that isn't being met by the established education outlets? Absolutely, uh, uh, yeah. yes. <laughs> I was going to jump go in ahead. before you and say yes, but go. You, I mean, we agree. Go ahead. I mean, come on, man. Universities forever have had continuing education offices. They're terrible. They're terrible. Yeah. Every place I've been, like there are no, I've not seen any effective programs that are tapping into all this interest, uh, senior ventures, uh, elder hostels, all that sort of thing. You know, there are models that are out there, but yeah, if we really are talking about somebody who has a, an engine and has some scientific background and can easily see how to take what we're doing here and make it into much, much bigger thing, that potential is there. I'm not the person to do that. I have no interest in that. But for sure, if, yeah. uh, if you are a business type person, this is right there waiting for you. T millions of people would love to take advantage of these opportunities if it's done right. So I don't know who that person is, but that would be the place to really expand this sort of thing. Yeah, I agree. The demand far exceeds what's currently offered in terms of supply like there's it's better we're in a better place than we've ever been with science in the public we've got there's science shows and programs and networks there's it's it's better than it's ever been but it's still so far behind what the demand is um and i think that's and it, whether it's a business kind of corporate model or it's more like nonprofit corp kind of places doing it but there's there the, it's wide open the the options are there the arena is open and someone just needs to kind of fill it i suppose so um yeah great question kate um squid squid lee for both or either of you do you have a roadmap for someone at a university that doesn't have this kind of public outreach but maybe they'd like to build it how would they start well that kind of just it dovetails into what we we're just talking about i think say that one again they're 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 at a university uh, do you have a roadmap for someone at a university that doesn't have this kind of public outreach, but maybe they'd like to build it? How would they start? So I think he's saying, give me the seed to build a, a public outreach thing. Um, and someone, I think they're asking someone at a university. So someone in our kind of situation. Okay. And no one else is doing something like that. 
All right, well, let me try another little pep talk here, Sean. Okay, yeah, I'm going right. to talk to this person. R okay, speech so. speech number two. Here we go. Sir or madam at a university, let's say that you are uh, at a, a large university and you are just starting your career there. Congratulations on your job. And you want to create some sort of public outreach initiative at your university. I applaud you. And if I can help you, you let me know. But I think it's going to be tough sledding because you're going to be so busy at your university with your day job, quote unquote, that it's going to take a good decade to navigate that world to get yourself practiced up with communicating. I'll just assume it's geology, but maybe it's not. And then more importantly, do you have allies at your university who will be willing and able to allow you to go in this direction. Because as we said at the beginning of this interview, this is a rigid dinosaur of a higher education world. And any sort of brand new idea is immediately viewed as threatening. It's scary. What is this person talking about? I don't know anybody at Stanford who does this, so absolutely not. Whatever you're talking about, I don't even know what it is. Don't do it. I don't, it, does, it doesn't even compute to me as an administrator. So that, I think, is what's maybe in your future. But if you have a couple of people who are in positions of authority at your university, and they see your talent, and they want to help you go in that direction, you can be way more effective than we are here. It just takes the right ability to kind of see that path and operate within the university system. But it's not going to be easy. You'd have to forge your own way, kind of yeah. like we have. And I would say it doesn't even have to be affiliated with the school. I was kind of careful early on. If you look at most of my videos, I hardly ever say College of Southern Idaho. I tried to set that boundary early on because uh, the university could get cold feet about some faculty member, staff member that has a social media platform, who knows what they're yapping about if they represent the views of the college or not. I mean, there, we actually have a division now at our school that like, like if the TV station wants to interview me, I have to call this person that comes and like, well, what's, what's the topic? Oh, um, wow. And, and they're not like censoring me or anything, but they just want to know. Right. Uh, and it's right. actually been okay. It hasn't been, but, but it's different than it used to be. Um, and so, so I would say one, do you even need to be affiliated with the university to do your public outreach? And then two, my advice would be just to start small. Like, like you started with downtown lectures. Like you didn't, you didn't start with, and it didn't exist, so it's a little bit different now, but you didn't start with Nick Zentner YouTube world. Um, and the same with me. Like I, it was little things. It was going to the, the Rotary Club and doing presentations and leading field trips for the museum and, 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 and then doing little things in the community. So it went for me, it went from very local to kind of regional and then to this level. And so I would encourage someone to kind of start small like that, too. Well, this this is a current interest of mine. So I appreciate the question from the, the young person at the university. Let me try to add to that. Yes, for quite some time, especially during the pandemic, it was totally separate from the university. Great. All right. But since we've come out of COVID, I, in the last two years, have been tight. That's kind of why I'm dark today, because it's like battling. Like, look, I've got a big audience. They are generous people. They know what's going on in this program. They're seeing these live seminars that we're doing on Friday mornings. Mm -hmm. I want to now try to take the university that I work at and this YouTube world that I have nurtured and make them work together. And it's not been easy mm -hmm. because people in my department are either threatened or like, uh-uh, or I've never seen what you're doing. It's like, I work in your department, man. You haven't watched <laughs> one freaking thing that I do. But we're starting slowly to actually get support for our students from my YouTube people. Yeah, I've seen that. And, and so it's... it's. Did you feel like it, that's greasing the skids from the higher ups that like, whoa, this, like it's getting easier or you still feel like it's tough sledding where you're at? 
it, it's slowly getting better. The university president is a big fan of this, and so that doesn't hurt. Uh, but it's even just marketing. I mean, our university is hurting. The enrollments are down. It's not just us. This is coming out of COVID. Universities are struggling. Some are even closing departments and so on. Yeah. And yet somehow the geology department at our university is like, what's going on? They've got all sorts of money coming in and, and new majors. Yeah. Like, huh, that's a weird one. I want, Why is that? And everybody else is struggling. Yeah, you guys are bucking they, the trend. They, yeah. They can't even see it, man. They can't even see it. <laughs> you mentioned, oh, so, so yeah, even recruiting, instead of sending a flyer to some high school or having a group come up from Moxie to visit the campus, this is a new way to advertise, like, come here. That, like, that's the hallway you'd be in. This is the chair you'd be sitting in. Yeah, That's another kind of new thing that is not just separate from my day job, but somehow trying to incorporate it. So we've got a couple of young faculty that I'm huge fans of because they can see. They see the connection. These, yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. So I'm just leaning into them big time. No, and I think, yeah, that's and that might be the future. And you're you're again kind of like ahead of the curve a little bit, not to not to give you too much gloss there, but. I, I'm kind of, I think, behind in that sense and that like the college is just now starting to see like, oh, like he's got a lot of people watching him. And this has all happened pretty recently. And we, I have students taking my online classes that are back east. They're not even here. And like, wh oh, why, is, why really? is this person even taking Sean Wilsey's class? Like, well, I saw his, I, saw, I like how he teaches and I, I can't be there. And some of these people have donated to the college. So I think whatever you do, I'll be paying close attention because I'm sort of behind you with my school. Mm. It'll be interesting to see where it goes, I guess is maybe a good way to put it. So Well, it's 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 one of those things that it doesn't happen overnight, but if you just keep pushing and keep trying a couple of new things, like most places, before you know it, then everybody's like, oh, yeah, that's how we're in. Yeah, oh, yeah. Right. Don't you know about our department? We got this great YouTube thing. Well, you just kind of get to that, that threshold and right. as soon as you cross the threshold then it's then it's good so yeah it, it's a frontier for i think higher education in general this is maybe something um yeah. people will want to emulate no no i appreciate that thanks um well i think there's a couple last, last questions here but i think i want to be respectful of your time and just thank you for being with us here today nick it was great just like a lot of things I do in life, whether it's a presentation at the Rotary Club or whatever, I have in my head a script of how things are going to go and it doesn't go that way, but it's better. Like, so whatever. <laughs> so this organic discussion, I think went much better. Um, you're obviously an easy de guest because you've done this so much. You know, it wasn't like dragging <laughs> responses out of you. So, but thanks for your time. Thanks for your frank discussions about all these topics related to outreach and all the great things you're doing. And I'll be watching, of course. I think we're kind of watching each other and working together. And I'd love to continue working with you however we can in the future. So thanks so much for your time. Thank you for the invitation, Sean. It's been a real pleasure to be with you today. You're doing great things. And I, I really know that you've got a lot of loyal followers who are with us right now. So thanks to everybody at home for being part of this today. Well, great. Thanks so much, Nick. I'm going to go ahead and shut the Zoom down, but you're welcome to watch the last little bit. So thanks again. Sounds good. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. See you, buddy. All right. Um, let's see. Let's see if we can get the webcam up and working now. The webcam is still not working, but I'll just go ahead and wrap it up here just with audio, if that's okay. Uh, again, thanks so much to Nick for spending time with us. We didn't get quite to all the questions that were sent to me, and I'm sure there was a lot more there as well. But want to thank all the viewers who helped participate. You guys gave us some great perspectives, um, not just in this live stream, but the community you've built both on my channel and in Nick's channel, I think has really helped us build uh, a better understanding of what we're doing with the public in terms of science education. So uh, I'll go ahead. Not sure why my webcam's not working. Actually, let me try one last little thing here. I've learned that when all else fails, you can try to plug it in 
and see if that works. If it just was having trouble with it, um, the Zoom OBS interface was just not working well. So, and again, as you've seen with me before, not a professional. There we go. And so, figuring this out as I go. So let's try this one more time. If it doesn't work, that's okay. Um, I think I need to have this looked at. This webcam has been giving me a few little issues here. Uh, let's try it one more time. Yeah, it's it's not working. So, but you can still hear me, so that's good. Uh, thanks again to Amanda, Joe, and Susan, our moderators that have been on the live chat. I'll be sure to go through that later and just take a look at it. Hope you guys had a good productive discussion there. Hope what we did here with Nick was of benefit to you. Uh, if you're interested in seeing something else like this, that would be fun. I think we could probably spend another session discussing some of these topics here. Um, I sure learned a lot just just talking with him and um, just working through some of these these uh, these kind of heavier topics about science and and the public and stuff. So thanks again for everyone for joining us. Um, I will be back with you later this week with some Iceland updates. I still have some videos from Bryce Canyon National Park that I'll put out there. We'll figure out what's going on with the webcam and get that fixed for you. And we'll just go ahead and sign off. Thanks so much again. Have a great day. Appreciate your time and learning with us and enjoy your day. Take care.